Hey everyone, in this video we'll discuss the concept of magnetism as well as ferromagnetic materials. This will be the introductory video on the topic of magnetism. Now I hope most of you are aware that magnets have poles, north and south poles. Regardless of the shape of the magnet, whether it's a U-shaped magnet, bar magnet or horseshoe magnet, you should be able to identify the two opposite polarities of these magnets. And a common application of magnets is in a compass, where the needle of the compass is made of a magnetic material. We define the magnetic fields or the poles of a magnet as north and south pole because the north pole of the compass needle will point towards the cardinal or the directional north pole of Earth. This is because Earth is actually a giant magnet itself. The north pole of Earth is actually its south magnetic pole. This means the north pole of the compass needle will be attracted towards the south magnetic pole of Earth, giving us a direction towards the true north. Magnetism, or the, the magnetic property of materials, are due to the magnetic fields, or what we call moments, of atoms that make up that material. The magnetic moments and fields of atoms are primarily caused by the orbital motion of electrons and atoms, as well as a property of electrons called electron spin. The term spin is a form of angular momentum possessed by all types of fundamental particles. This includes electrons, protons and neutrons, which are all found in the atom. Spin is a fundamental property of these particles, just like how charge and mass are. A particle could be charged, either positive or negative, and it will also have mass. Spin is just another property of these particles that will give rise to the magnetic properties. For example, the spin of electrons will give rise to its own magnetic field. And depending on the direction of this angular momentum or spin, the direction of the magnetic field, that is where the north and south pole are orientated for the electron, will be different. In the orbitals of most atoms, electrons are paired such that the direction of the spin and magnetic moments or fields are opposite to one another. This effectively cancels out the effect of the magnetic moment, resulting in an atom that is magnetically neutral. In ferro magnetic materials such as iron, nickel, cobalt and gadolinium, the atoms in these materials will contain orbitals that have unpaired electrons. As a result, the magnetic fields produced by these unpaired electrons will cause the atom to produce its own magnetic field. You can think about the magnetic field of the atom as the cumulative effect of the smaller magnetic fields produced by each of these unpaired electrons in the atom. Atoms with magnetic fields due to unpaired electrons can also have their direction, so north and south pole. We can have two situations, one where the direction of the fields of the atoms are not aligned so they are pointing, they are directed in random directions, or in a situation where the magnetic field of the atoms are aligned so that they're directed in the same direction. In this instance, where the fields of atoms are aligned in such a way, this is known as a magnetic domain. So magnetic domain in the context of ferro magnetic materials refer to a region in the material where the magnetic moments or fields of the atoms are aligned in the same direction. Let's say I have a rectangular block of iron, which is a ferro magnetic material. I have arbitrarily drawn different regions in this material in which the arrows indicate the collective direction of the magnetic fields of the atoms. This is known as one domain, and this is another one. You can see in the first example, the direction of the domains are randomly orientated. In this instance, the material is said to be unmagnetized because the overall magnetic moment of these domains will cancel each other out. If we somehow can align the direction of these domains in the same direction, parallel to one another, this is how we can make the ferro magnetic material become magnetized. So by way of review, fundamental particles like electrons have a property called spin. The spin is what causes electrons to act as small magnets and produce their own magnetic fields. In the case where a material such as a ferromagnetic material like iron have unpaired electron spins in the atoms, 
This will cause the atom to become a magnet itself. So the atom here will also produce its own magnetic field. When we have multiple atoms that are aligned in the same direction, this will cause the magnetic field to become even stronger. And in this instance, this is what we call a magnetic domain. And in a material where the magnetic domains are randomly orientated, it is unmagnetized. And in the case where it can become aligned in the same direction, it will become magnetized. So let's talk about magnetization. How do we actually make a material go from unmagnetized into magnetized? The simple answer is we will apply an external magnetic field. So by placing a permanent magnet or another material that has a magnetic field nearby, and this external magnetic field will start to influence the direction of the domains in the material. The first thing that happens is domain alignment, where the domains that are not aligned with this external field will start to reorientate themselves so that they can become aligned with the field. So let's say if I apply a south pole at the top and a north pole at the bottom of this particular ferromagnetic material that's originally unmagnetized, the domains that are not previously aligned that I'm circling right now, these will start to reorientate such that the north pole will be attracted towards the south pole of the external magnet and the south pole of the domains will be attracted towards the north pole of the external magnetic field. This will lead to the next stage of magnetization called domain growth, where the domains that are aligned with the external field will become larger. And as they expand in size, this will decrease the number of domains in the material such that more and more of these domains will become aligned with the external magnetic field until they reach the last stage called saturation where almost all, if not all, of the domains are directed in the same orientation which causes the ferromagnetic material to now become magnetized. When it is magnetized, it will behave as a magnet itself. So ferromagnetism, or materials that are described as ferromagnetic, can be magnetized through this way to become permanent magnets themselves. When they become permanent magnets through magnetization, they will be strongly attracted to other magnetic fields. For example, if we use a bar magnet near a nail made of iron, if this iron was unmagnetized by sweeping a bar magnet nearby, we can align all the magnetic domains in this iron nail so that the nail becomes magnetic and will act as a permanent magnet as well. When the nail becomes magnetic, it will be strongly attracted to the bar magnet. Ferrule magnetism for all materials can only occur under a certain temperature, known as the Curie temperature. And this is different depending on the ferrule magnetic material. For iron, which is a very common example of this, this is 1043 kelvins, which is roughly 770 degrees Celsius. Now, something that's very important for you to be aware of and understand is that once we remove this bar magnet or an external magnetic field that we previously used to magnetize the material, the domains in the material, such as an iron nail, will slowly reorientate away from its alignment so that over time, less and less domains will be pointing in the same direction. And that's why these ferromagnetic materials, although they're described as permanent magnets, are not necessarily permanent because they lose their magnetic property slowly over time due to the reorientation of the domains. Like electric fields, magnetic fields help us visualize both the direction and the strength of the magnetic fields. The density of the field lines will indicate the strength of the field. So the closer the field lines are, the stronger the field would be in that given location. The direction of field lines are drawn in such a way so that it goes from the north pole to the south pole of the field outside the magnets. So if you take a look at the two bar magnets here, when the field lines emerge from the north pole of the magnet, they go around the magnet and return to the south pole. So this is outside the actual magnetic material. In the material, the field lines also exist. They will go from south pole to the north pole. So you can see in this diagram here, the field lines in the magnet will run from the south pole towards the top, towards the north pole here. The strength of the magnetic field is represented by the symbol B and has the SI units of Tesla, T for short, or Weber's per meter squared. 
Because magnetic fields are orientated in a three-dimensional space, we often use dots and crosses to denote directions of fields that run either into the page or out of the page. This convention will become very useful and important as you go into year 12 physics. When we use dots, this represents a vector that's coming out of the page. So in the context of a magnetic field, you have to imagine that the field lines are coming towards you as you're watching this video. If you see magnetic field lines represented by crosses, this means the field lines are going away from you into the page or into the screen. When we place two or more magnetic fields near each other, the direction of field lines depend on the relative position of north and south pole of the magnetic fields. We know that opposite poles, north and south pole, will produce an attractive magnetic force between them. And as such, the magnetic field lines will be continuous between the north and south pole. It will run from the north pole towards the south pole of the other magnets. In the case where there are two like poles, such as two north poles or two south poles, a repulsive magnetic force is present between them. And as such, the magnetic field lines will not be continuous and they will run in such a way so that they repel from one another. In both these cases, the density of the field lines still represent the field strength. When the field lines are closer together, this represents a stronger magnetic field. And when the field lines are further apart, in the case between two north poles or two south poles, the field strength is weaker. I want to quickly discuss some of the similarities and differences between electric and magnetic fields. When we have a dipole, in electric fields, the lines will go from positive to negative charge. In the case of a magnetic field, this will always go from north pole towards the south pole. As you can see, the density of the field lines varies as it indicates the strength of the fields. One distinct difference that you need to be aware of is that electric charges can be isolated so that you can have an electric field produced by only a positive charge or you can have a field produced only by a negative charge. In the case of magnets or magnetic fields, if we try to isolate the north and south pole by cutting a magnet, this will not result in the same outcome as what happened with the charges. If we cut this magnet in half, the new right end of the bar magnet will become the new south pole, and the new left end of the blue part of the magnet will become the new north pole. This means for every magnet, there's always going to be a north and a south pole. You can never have a north pole on its own, and you can never have a south pole on its own. So for electric fields, we explain this as the fields are able to exist as monopoles, as individual positive or negative charges, but for magnetic fields, they always exist in the dipole, always north and south pole together. This concludes a video on magnetism and ferromagnetic materials. Hey everyone, if you found this video helpful, smash that like button and don't forget to subscribe. Want even more? Become a Patreon member for early access to videos, exclusive Discord discussions about questions on chemistry and physics, and live preparation sessions for your exams. Don't forget to head over to our website for topic tests and practice exams to further improve your understanding and learning.